a warm welcome from the team Synodent to one and all who have joined in for the webinar across the globe. On the auspicious occasion of Dashera, we would like to extend our greetings to each and everyone present here. I, Dr. Shubankar Nankhedkar from Team Synodent, working as the state coordinator of Maharashtra, I am the host for today's webinar, along, along with Honorable Dr. Nikhil Varma, sir, and Dr. Anmol Bagaria, with the co-host, budding and enthusiastic dentist, Shritej Jagtap, the college president for MGM Dental College and Hospital, Navi Mumbai. I would like to, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Anmol Bagaria, the founder and CEO of Synodent for conducting this webinar. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce Synodent to all of you. Synodent is a unique platform, first time in India, a digital healthcare platform that provides and enhances a good relationship between patients and doctors, also enables a real-time appointment scheduling system. Our goal is to create a easy access to healthcare services and communication ways or appointment scheduling system, not only between the dentist and the patient, but also for medical practitioners, diagnostic lab laboratories, to radio radiological services and pharmaceutical services, and also research and educational programs for doctors to enhance their knowledge and keep them updated regarding the same. Synodin brings together at economic prices and minimum waiting time because everyone has 24 hours and everyone wants to utilize without wasting time. Synodent is here to create precious and healthy smiles on our patient faces with minimum effort and maximum welfare. Synodent is an initiative that will put up all its efforts to create that beautiful smile on our patient's face always. Now, patients don't have to fear for those long quiz and busy dentists when they get a toothache. So, I am very glad to have you all here with us and I hope you are excited for the webinar. So, let's introduce the topic for today's webinar. Topic, Implant Occlusion, a key in implant success. And for the same topic we have honorable dr nikhil verma sir with us he is mds maxillofacial prosthodontist and implantologist sir is the dean of gitanjali dental and research institute udaipur rajasthan he is the professor and head of the department of prosthodontics of the same institute he is the proud owner of smiles dental care and implant center udaipur with the experience of 18 plus years and speaker at the national and international platform. Sir has 38 national and international publications to his credit. He is an active member of Indian Prosthodontic Society and International Society of Maxillofacial Research. He has been awarded twice as the Dentist of the Year by the Mewar Health Care Awards organized by the Times Group of India. We are really honored to have you, sir and we feel blessed that you took out time for us. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Anmol and the team. Uh, I uh, am really overwhelmed by the you know, uh, kind of gesture what you have given to me. And uh, it will be uh, nice to share my experience with the uh, audience in here. Okay. Not taking much time because the topic is really, very large. I would like to start the broadcast. So I am sure that you must be doing implants or you must be aware of the implants. Uh, and yeah, this is it. So implants are not, uh, you know, it's not a new terminology to all of us. And uh, it has been practiced since long, you know, uh, since the years and where the brain mark actually had accidentally discovered the osteointegration phenomena between the bone and the implant and since then they, they have been a revision and i remember that when i used to practice the implant okay uh, when i started doing implant in 2002 the 
overall India, you know, the implant was trying to pick it up. But this is the data from the uh, Journal of Korean Association of Oral Microbiology Surgery, which was done in 2014. And this says this uh, around 1 lakh to 3 lakh implants are placed uh, every year, which is almost equivalent to your, uh, you know, hip. Now, this data is basically not for India. This data is for their nation, okay? And uh, 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 what I have to say about India is really very different because, you know, Indian data has not been published. But as far as my experience goes, I have been uh, in rise since uh, uh, I have placed my implants in 2002 in uh, Udaipur and now, and I'm doing it now, the data are really risen. But this is the most scary part that how many root canals also you are doing in your clinical practice. But if you are ignoring a root canal and you're just placing an implant, then definitely the implants are going to increase. And so the implant failures are going to increase. So uh, let's come to the topic as, you know, the implant is different from natural teeth. Yes, definitely implant is uh, different from natural teeth because, you know, you can see that uh, there is uh, no amount of, you know, parental ligament in the implant. So in natural tooth, okay, natural tooth, the connection of the bone going to be the parent and here the implant is going to be, you know, with the osseointegration integration is directly integrated with the bone. Proprioception, you have parental uh, mechanoreceptors, whereas the implant, there is an osteoperception. Tactile sensitivity in natural tooth, because there is a mechanoreceptor, they are, they are located in the PDL, okay. So definitely the perception, the tactile sensitivity is going to be higher as compared to your implant. The mobility is going to be between 25 to 100 microns uh, of the tooth. It can go more for the different kind of tooth, you know. And for the implant, it's going to be 3 to 5 microns. The moment phases, two phases, that is primary and nonlinear, and complex, that is linear and elastic. There is, in implant, you have one phase, linear and elastic. Movement pattern, the, there is an immediate uh, movement in the tooth, and the secondary is gradual. If you have a concussion injury, definitely the implant, uh, the, the natural tooth is going to go down and then finally it's going to retrieve back. But in an implant, it is gradual. You just cannot press the implant. It will chip off through fracture or something, you know, all this sort of thing can happen. Welcome to the little port, apical third of the root. This we going to see in the detail. Okay. The uh, fulcrum of the Implant, I mean, where the implant is going to rotate, you know, if you apply a load on the topmost part, where the implant is going to rotate, the implant is going to rotate on the crestal bone, whereas in the tooth, we know that the uh, fulcrum lies there in the mid part of the root, okay. Load bearing characteristic, shock absorbing, functional stress distribution, that is because of the PDL, but whereas in the implant, it is the stress concentration again on the crestal bone. Signs of overloading, you have parental thickening, mobility, VF acid, you have primitives, you have pain. Whereas in implant, there is no pain. Pain is the last thing to have. Before that, you might have a screw loosening. You might have a screw fracture or simply a bone loss. Patient will normally come to you and say, Dr. Sahib, implant is dry, but he will never say that, you know, uh, he will, uh, uh, obviously he'll say that implant is mobile, but he'll not try to say that uh, uh, implant is actually having a pain. Okay, pain is the later concept and then there's a lot of increased mobility. Now, let's see again the, you know, the, the tooth, when you apply a lot of force, okay, there's a PDL which is surrounding, there is an implant, there is no PDL to support it. Now, we, we all know about, you know, the uh, Wolf's Law, okay, and there was a general dental sciences, they published an article where it was Dang, who and the, uh, Dang had told about the classical Wolf Law. And on that Wolf Law, they told that there can be a remodeling which is happening, okay. Based on this only, Frost Mechanostat theory told that they, where mechanical loading increases excessively, overload resorption may occur within the bone loss. So whenever the bone is going to be stressed upon, whenever the forces are going to be stressed upon, there will be a, a bone loss which is going to happen and which is not good for the implant. Now, this is the most important part which I uh, re really would like to emphasize on key, why we should not compare a tooth to the uh, your natural tooth to the implant because of, you know, if you see the density and elastic modulus and a poison ratio, poison ratio is the difference between a longitudinal uh, strain and a lateral strain. When you try a thing, okay, so how much of the strain is going to have on the, this is longitudinally, if you are pulling, laterally is going to have some effect or not, okay. So if you see that the PDL, 
in this. For the first, if your cortical bone, the density is 1.74. Trabecular bone, the density reduces. Dentine definitely it has an increase. PDL definitely the density will go down. Titanium and alloy goes to 4.1. See the density again has to be much higher than the titanium. But titanium is uh, uh, softer than the you know all ceramic FPD. We know that 4.1. The elastic modulus. The elastic modulus of the cortical bone is 14,700, but the trabecular bone it drops to 1470. It means that the elasticity of a trabecular bone is much more. Dentine, it is 18,600. PDL, PDL is elastic, so it is 17.3. The titanium alloy is 11,000. Okay, and uh, sorry, one lakh, uh, you know, uh, 10,000. Whereas in all ceramic FPD, you can see the uh, figure is one lakh 40,000. Okay. Now, poison ratio in the PDL, if you see, it is 0.45. It means when you subject to a longitudinal stress, the lateral stress also is going to occur. So that is the poison ratio. Okay. And whereas in PDL, it is quite more, titanium is comparable. Titanium alloy, it is comparable. So titanium, though being a lot of dense, low having a lot of elastic modulus, higher elastic modulus, but it's, you know, it is, you know, uh, it is subjected to some kind of strain. Okay. So now, what is the difference between natural tooth and a uh, uh, implant? The so viscoelastic or a shock absorber thing, which is a PDL, which is available in your implant, which is not available in your, uh, which is available in your natural teeth, but which is not available in uh, you know uh, your uh, implant. So we are, we'll be going to see that what you know amount of stresses, mobility, elastic modulus, the or the what are the going to be your precursor signs? Let's go to the first one: amount of stresses. Compared with the tooth, the direct bone interface with an implant is not a resilient. We are not going to have a resilient interface. We are going to have a rigid interface as compared to your natural tooth. So the energy imparted by the occlusal force is not partially dissipated, but it transmits to the higher intensity of the contiguous bone. Okay. If you have, if you are going to, uh, if you are eating a food and you have small amount of, you know, a hard material which comes off. Okay. You will have proprioceptors. Okay which is uh, carrying a reception with the help of uh, your uh, PDL, the immediately you will have jaw just reflex and you're going to open it. But in an implant, okay, you will not realize that. And the stresses are going to be transferred on your uh, your uh, crystal bone, which is more dangerous. And if you're a heavy chewer, if you're a bruxism, you'll not come to know uh, initially. You'll come to know later on when there is a bone loss, a screw losing or there's a fracture. Now the treatment plan, now while, while you are uh, doing implant, okay, so you design that, you know, how much of implant you are going to do and uh, where is the position going to be there and what are going to be designed, okay. And when you have achieved the rigid fixation, okay, the uh, primary cause, when, when you apply, uh, you know, forces, the primary cause of initial long-term bone loss around implant is just this treatment plan. So if your treatment plan is not good, if your implant design is not perfect, if your Number of implants are not good. If your positions are not perfect, okay, the bone loss will definitely be contributory to your treatment plan. Now, the, let's see the elastic modulus again. On the uh, let's focus on the right side diagram. You have bone that is 18, dentine that is 18.3, and the enamel that is 18.84. Okay, so bone and dentine that is a tooth. Okay, it is almost similar modulus velocity. Now, why this is important? You, we see that yellow uh, structure line, the greater the flexibility difference between two materials, the greater of potential relative motion generated between the two surfaces at the transosseal region. It means that if you have uh, uh, two interfaces which are not having, which, which are having mismatch in the uh, modulus of velocity, one material is going to be rigid and one material is going to be soft. So if there is a constant loading on the one material, okay, so this material is going to slip away the other. It may, I mean to say that if you have used a post, if you have used a, a carbon fiber post, okay, and if you have used a titanium, uh, if you have used a, a stainless steel post, if you apply a stress on both the teeth so that the fracture of tooth occurs, the fracture of tooth in a carbon fiber post is going to have on a uh, interface of crystal. Crystal interface will be there, where the crystal bone is going to be there, okay. But whereas a, a stainless steel post, Okay, the fracture is going to occur below the bone. Okay, and that's how those, you know, fiber post was really, very, very popular. Okay, so now what I'm trying to say that the titanium, because having a larger interface, okay, and the bone, which is having the modulus of, you know, 18.3, uh, 18 uh, gigapascal, okay, 
so when implants are subjected to load okay so they don't move but the bone inside they give the mobility to it and when the implant are subjected to it so they are particularly transferring the stress to the bone resulting in the resorption of the bones the second most important part that the natural tooth are oval in shape they were root which are you know tortuous or they are they are dilated or they are multiple in number whereas the implant the implant is round in shape okay <coughs> so the greater the width of the transosseal structure the less of the magnitude of stress transmitted to the uh, starting uh, the surrounding bone okay so if you have a width which is more the transfer of stress is also less because the the area distribution is more so if you have a choice of 5 mm implant and 3.5 mm implant you always prefer a 5 mm implant but in this process we also forget that uh, you know you don't see the bone that whether the 1 mm bone is there on the buccal side and lingual side and on the mesial side and distal side okay we need to see that bone also so if you find that a 3.5 mm if you have a you know 5 mm width of a bone what implant choice will be there the implant choice they're going to you might be 4 mm okay 5 mm bone is there we'll go with for uh, you know uh you know for mm plan but it's a bad choice you have to go for a 3.5 but 3.5 mm width of a plan for a molar is going to be bad okay so uh, this is all theoretical we are going to go for evidence based studies and all those things in later part of my you know presentation I'll, i'll i'll show you that you know the implant success rate might differ and it differs from patient to patient there is no particular scheme to say that one scheme is superior to the thing and you might have a implant which is 3.5 8 mm of uh, height they they have lasted for a good number of years okay so implants are almost all round in cross section which is less effective in resisting lateral bending forces and consequent stress concentration in the crestal region of jaw so implant the major problem what is going to have is the tooth is able to dissipate the entire load on different areas of the bone you know wherever the contact is there whereas the implant the stress concentration will not be the entire range okay it will be there mainly on the crest tooth so the choice comes as ki we need to place a longer implant yes a uh, minimal longer that is 10 mm 11.5 mm maximum 30 mm but the people who have been placing 16 16 mm implants or more than that they have been uh, showing no use of it mobility the mobility of tooth is subjected to stress applied and the tooth returns back to its original position with the respect of the magnitude of the moment okay so when you apply a load on the tooth the tooth returns back so that is what is the mobility is about okay so you see that the tooth is mobile okay but the implant is supposed to be mobile well implant is not supposed to be mobile with the naked eye if it is mobile then it is gone it is it is removed and placed with different uh, implant right the pit measurement of uh, individual teeth in the axial direction that is general dental restorative in 1960 this article 1960 and we have seen this uh, uh, picture in uh, okay and they found that uh, you know mullman found that the tooth movement may be divided into initial mobility and the secondary mobility okay and the horizontal movement of natural teeth is 56 to 108 micrometers so vertical movement initial vertical tooth movement is 28, 28 micron okay and immediate remand is 7 micron so if you get up in the morning you might see that the lower central cells are slightly mobile and patient really comes to you and say no oh, i mean you know when i get up in the morning my teeth are mobile you know the lower central cells and upper central cells or the lateral cells is also mobile okay you will have to explain that you know the tooth has not been subject to stress okay so the mobility is going to be there in the morning okay the so patient who are bruxer you ask them to observe whether mobility is there or not they will say there is no mobility in the tooth and that is dangerous you know because you know patient is bruxer patient doesn't give you a history of bruxism okay if patient is giving the history of bruxism final very good okay but patient if you say that he's having a lot of jaw pain and all those things and you doubt that you know patient started with clenching or a bruxing okay they are uh, initial uh, uh, cases they are very difficult to diagnose okay so no when the patient comes to you when you are taking implant history and you want to place implant in these kind of patient and they are not going to give you history you can ask them a simple point that in the morning you know you try and shake your central cell or you know uh, try to shake your uh, uh, even your uh, you know uh, 3 4 or 4 4 okay is there any mobility or not in patient while i tell you you know if he is observant definitely okay there is no clinical or you know uh, parameter or there is no uh, uh, theoretical parameter to say so but yeah 
this can be a clinical tool to uh, just that okay so implant vertical movement is 2 to 3 micron and maximum to your uh, you know 10 micron now again the digital in ring of biodental implant that was uh, rangert and curry suggested as a part of the movement in the implant movement may be due to the component flexure okay so movement in the implant what you're talking about it is not that the you know the implant is moving in the bone it can be due to the component flexure also okay but i had told you that there is a difference in the modulus of elasticity between a bone and an implant so if the uh, you know the movement is going to occur the moment is going to occur like a lot of forces are going to be applied on a mechanoprocessory of you know that time you definitely have a bone loss but the mobility uh, initial mobility what you observe okay the uh, in a, a non bruxer cases or not in over loading cases okay so type of movement vertical clinical mobility natural tooth zero and a dental implant is also zero initial vertical movement okay 28 micron uh, micron for uh, according to the bracket 1960 and uh, dental implant is going to be 2 to 3 micron knetal in 1986 horizontal tooth movement that is your uh, 56 to 108 micron means horizontally the tooth is more mobile and implant is going to be less than 73 uh, micron mobile okay which is not to be seen from your uh, naked eyes now you can see the crystal bone loss around the implant you can really appreciate uh, this crystal bone and entire study which are based, you know, the platform switching and, you know, we used to have external hacks, now you have internal hack. All those studies have been there just to avoid this particular bone loss. The occlusion of the implant is also considered about this particular bone loss. Okay, so crystal bone loss is a very deleterious kind of thing and you are supposed to take care about the not happening that, you know. You might have initial, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are various articles to say that crystal bone loss is a regular phenomena and you might have uh, first year, you might have 1.5 mm, then subsequent year it is going to be 0.5 mm. But yeah, I mean, these are very old uh, versions of study, but uh, the men platform switching, other things have, uh, I mean, have come. They really maintain the bone height and the bone height, crystal bone height is really a significant phenomena in evaluating the implant over the period of years. Now, what are the philosophies of occlusion for implants? Okay. So you can see that the buccal cups are not contacting. Okay, they are just slightly off the occlusion, whereas on the uh, pore and, uh, you know, the natural teeth, they are having their contact. This is the type of occlusion we are supposed to give. Now, occlusion, it is defined as a static relationship between an incising or a masticating surfaces of maxillary or mandibular teeth or tooth and a log. Okay, this is a GPT classification. Now, what is uh, implant protective occlusion, which are which we are going to call as IPO? Okay, for the future references, we are going to call it as IPO. A proper occlusion scheme is a primary requisite for a long-term survival, especially when a parafunction or a marginal foundations are present. A poor occlusion scheme both increases the magnitude of load and intensifies mechanical stresses at the crest of the bone. So again, the crest of the bone is really an important figure. Okay, and you need to have a proper occlusion scheme. So. Poor occlusion screen will definitely increase the magnitude of load and it also identifies. Now, how? If you have a bigger tooth, okay, if you have a larger tooth with a long, short cusp, okay, what will happen? It is going to face more forces. But where you have a small occlusal area, okay, not having steep cusp incline, it will going to have a lesser load, okay. So, implant protective occlusion was previously presented as a, a medial position lingualized occlusion and developed by Kalmish. This occlusion concept refers to as occlusion plan that is often unique and specifically designed for restoration of industrial implant, providing an environment for improved clinical longevity uh, of both implant and the processes. So while you're placing implant, the implant is not the only one point, okay? Patient has not come to you for implant. Patient has actually come to you for a tooth, okay? And if your tooth are not going to be long lasting, okay, you are in trouble because, you know, patient is going to come back to you and say, Doctor, I had come for the tooth and, you know, the tooth, has, I mean, if the, there is, uh, you know, the ceramic fracture also there, okay. The ceramic chip off is also there. Patient will not blame on the implant. Patient say that, doctor, it is you who is responsible for it, okay. And it is not you, actually, it is occlusion which is responsible for it. So, implant occlusion, they are going to be different for your uh, single crown, FPD, collage processes, screw retained, okay, and uh, your uh, overdentures. 
So now see the different tooth forms and uh, occlusal form. Let's go from the uh, right side of your screen from the anatomy, and you can see that how the teeth are fitting. You know, uh, you know, cusp and fossa relationship. You can see how it is going to generate uh, load on your. Uh, you know, the cusp are going to generate uh, load on the fossa and on the incline of the fossa. That is really very important. Now you see the semi anatomy. The force has now reduced. The lateral force, the horizontal force, is reduced. Okay. If you see the lingual contact, which is the most preferred, which is the most preferred contact. Okay. You see in here, the buccal cusp is not coming in contact. Only the lingual surface is coming in contact with the central fossa. Okay. There can be a combination of you know uh, where you have uh, uh, you know good amount of uh, lingual uh, cusp and uh, the other part is flat. The flat of lingual plane on the Tooth, and you can see can see the corresponding down below the figure. Okay, uh, that is uh, you know you have a flat cut facing a cut. Okay, and when you have a monoplane, I mean both the things are going to be you know in a in a uh, in a flat plane occlusion. Okay, these are not preferred. Okay, you can have a combination lingual contact that is more preferred semi anatomic. Uh, again, you should do it semi anatomic because the patient is going to complain of you know okay, I'm unable to chew my food efficiently. Okay. After have put have a tooth, you know, uh, semi anatomic tooth will not give you the same efficiency of the anatomic tooth. Okay, so if you give a lingual contact or a combination, patient is going to complain if you that I'm not able to chew food properly or I take a lot of time in uh, you know completing my food, which is a uh, not like my uh, patient. So tooth forms again, we know that it is anatomic and uh, non anatomic, and uh, I'm sure uh, the semi anatomic part are uh, missing in it. Okay, occlusal scheme. We 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 already know that there is canine guidance. That is, you have mutual protected. Then you have a group function. You have a lingualized. That is balanced and a monoplane. Philosophy of occlusion. Now, this is the you know, thing which I wanted really to get highlight that one type of tooth form will not. You know, you you cannot go into the one tooth form that I have to give give this tooth form in every implant case. One type of occlusal scheme you cannot choose that. Or if patient preferred by the patient, no, you cannot do that. Okay, or you cannot say that uh, you know in this case that is going to be more efficient, or this case that will be more efficient. You know, you might have choices. Okay, but the final goal is based on the principle which we are going to uh, you know highlight here. Now, why are we discussing about it? What is the rationale of having a uh, you know good occlusal scheme? or uh, you know uh, implant protective occlusion okay why we are trying to protect the implant okay and what are the goals so it is to maintain the occlusal load that has been transferred to the implant body within the physiologic limit you don't want to across those you know physiological limits so that you no know, old loading is uh, you know you don't want to do old loading to minimize the old load uh, to the bone because implant is old loaded it transfer the stresses there it transfer the stresses mainly on the crest of bone Now, development of the occlusal scheme that minimizes the risk factors and allows the restoration to a function in harmony with the rest of the somatogenetic system. Okay, so if if your one particular part is stressed, or if you if you have a high point in particular area, then what will happen? The entire somatogenetic system, your TMDA, your muscles of mastication, everything will be get disturbed. The clinical success and longevity of the endoscopic implant as load bearing abutments are controlled largely by the mechanical setting in which they function. So it's a mechanical thing which you have given, and they are going to function. The load bearing is going to function if you have given them something really very good to function it very smoothly. Okay. So treatment plan is responsible for design. We already discussed about this part. Okay. The treatment plan is responsible for design of the implant, the number of the implant, and the position of the implant. now what what will happen if you are going to load it you know consequences of uh, mechanical uh, old load first thing is component fracture might occur crest of bone may occur screw losing may occur implant might fail okay post in fracture very very difficult complication to handle prosthesis fracture okay peri implant as uh, peri implant disease okay so these are all you know consequences of bimechanical old load you might give implant i had a case where i gave implant to the patient and patient was a bruxism uh, suffering from bruxism okay i gave him a very good implant i checked you know from my penguin i have a penguin not hospital for a rfa and uh, i checked everything patient gone and patient comes to me after 6 months back and he says you doctor the process mobile 
So when the process was mobile and you know a patient was from you know some 80 90 kilometers from my place and when patient come to you say doctor uh, you know the process was mobile you you are troubled but not a far a lot because in a heart you know ki okay i've done everything good i've checked everything might be it is just a, a prosthetic uh, loosening of the uh, screw loosening is there i'll handle it patient came to me i started tightening the tooth okay and i could see that there is a slight mobility with the implant I, it was two implant and uh, uh, you know it, it was a bridge i joined uh, 3 3 and uh, 3 5 okay so i gave him 3 4 okay i didn't give 3 6 okay and uh, he was not having 6 so we are going for 5 to 5 occlusion not for 6 to 6 occlusion so i gave him and you know i, I saw that you know it was slightly mobile and uh, it was worrisome to me what i am how am i supposed to say to the patient that you know the implant was actually failing i cannot hide it also so patient came back to me after some time and uh, you know after one month i gave him appointment i counseled him that we'll have to change one more position and we'll have to place one more implant and uh, probably you are overloading it i mean uh, I'm, i you cannot say that you are overloading it you know but sometimes in the clinical practice you might have to tell to the patient that, that the overload is there you know you are and i told him to go on the right side also there was a right i mean uh, there so there was only four on the other side and there was no five and six I had asked him to go for implant on the other side also, but he resisted to it. So they were the overload. Okay. When these kind of cases are going to come to you in clinic, they are very difficult to handle. Okay. We manage that case, but not every patient is so cooperative. So occlusion and implants, the evidence is reviewed by Taylor Wayne and uh, take that article, you know, 2005 article from JPD. And he said that no evidence at present, I mean, at present means 2005. Say that progressive occlusion loading of implant is beneficial. Now, this is a very controversial statement with the made. Okay. Or occlusion overload is detrimental to implant. Okay. They, they think there's no, uh, you know, it is a finite element uh, uh, analysis. Okay. And this article was really, you know, took my eye. Okay. That's why I mentioned this article. But definitely, uh, progressive occlusion loading of implant is beneficial. Okay. Although many of the occlusal concepts are similar in removal and FPD, uh, several aspects unique to implant supported processes and therefore constitute your ICO. So now let's focus on the uh, ICO. The occlusal screen in the combination of various principles which need to be addressed when fabricating your implant supported processes. What are the major points or uh, carry points? No premature occlusal contact or interferences. That is your Timing of occlusal contact. We want to go to this point again. Let me read out all four first. Influence of the surface area, mutually protected articulation, implant body and the occlusal load. Okay. Now, first, or later three points we are going to discuss, the, uh, you know, down there again. But the first point is really very important that no premature occlusal contact or interferences. When you are giving a process to the patient, okay, that time you have Bosch keep, you know, you go those shimmers and all those things are there. You take those occlusal uh, 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 films are there. I mean, not occlusal films, those you, you uh, take a bite of the patient and say that whether that can come out or not. Okay. So, while you're going to articulating paper, I, I should precisely <laughs> miss that point, articulating paper. Okay. So, if you are going to put an articulating paper in the patient's mouth, which micron you want to put? What are you having in your clinic? Okay. How much micron, you know, the paper is going to come out from the tooth? Okay. So, those are the key points in the implant practice. Okay. We know that the natural teeth are compressible. Now, supposedly, if you are giving a single tooth processes on 3.6, patient is having 3.7, patient is having 3.5. Okay. Now, the 3.7 should come in an equal contact with 3.5 or 3.6 or 3.7. No, it should be below the occlusion. So 12 micron articulate paper should be able to pass on from this. Okay. And if it is meet, meeting the same contact, what will happen? Okay. The teeth eventually, you know, the teeth are going to go away. I mean, you know, when the patient bites, okay, the natural tooth is going to get compressed. But what happened about implant? The implant no longer going to get compressed. So it's going to be leader. It's going to be standing tall and finally bearing all the load and you'll have textual bone loss. Okay. So by uh, articulating <coughs> a paper or 12 micron, make sure that it really comes out from there. Now, other features are cusp angle of crown. We want to see everything, okay? Cantilever offset distance, crown height, 
occlusal contact position where the occlusal contact position there in the among the tooth cusp okay it's going to be buccal it's going to be central it's going to be lingual implant crown contour you know large contour or you want to be shallow contour then we need to protect the weakest component okay we know where is the weakest component okay now sometimes your implant patient more lingual okay and you are Uh, you cannot place your buccal contact buccal uh, you know cusp to be in contact with the uh, you know functional uh, in in the function there okay so you are going to grind that away because you know what is the weakest component because if there is a buccal loading what will happen the screw loosening is going to happen again and again <coughs> sorry so <coughs> this is the point i am trying to talk about that when you have a functional load okay try to load it more vertically not horizontally let's see in the two cases what happens <coughs> sorry so you have a personal load and you see that the crestal bone on the crestal bone the loading is more vertical so this can be really absorbed very nicely with the implant and the bone interface but on the second part if you see okay the so one part is being overloaded and one part is going to be underloaded and this was the theory principle of frost and wool till they say okay that if this kind of loading is very frequent okay when you remove it how do you extract it you apply horizontal force so horizontal force is always deleterious and you are not supposed to do those horizontal movements now this is a very good diagram okay which says that angle load to the implant long axis increases the compressive forces at the crestal ridge on the opposite side of the implant in which the force is directed so if you are applying forces on the buccal side it is the lingual side which is going to face the pressure whereas when you want to apply a load it should be transferred equally on the buccal and lingual crestal bone but if you are applying forces more from the buccal side because there is the angulation so lingual side bone will be facing lot of forces okay so this is a diagram which says the you know buccal force component and angular offset is going to be there the diagram is much more clear angle of the about increases the crest load increases okay so the cl is the crest load you can see the l and b is the you know lingual and buccal okay and there is a crest uh, moment load 0 0 angle force component is 126 uh, 96 9 uh, and 86.9 okay buccal force component is 25.9 the second figure and it really increases to 50.9 newton which is very deleterious when you go for 30 degree angulation okay So that's why most of the companies doesn't manufacture 30 degree angulation. They restrict to 20. Okay, some companies go for 25. Okay, but some people say that our restriction is really very good. We can go for 30. You can go for 35. Don't trust them. Don't trust them because you will. You are not supposed to do that. A crown cusp angle. Okay, so if you you know <coughs> the tooth and implant comparison cusp. CR is the center of root. I had told you. The center rotation of the in the root, where the implant, the fulcrum line, the fulcrum line is going to be there on the crestal bone. Okay, so cuspal inclination, you see the force which is applied. Okay, so now on the left side of your figure, if you see the forces are more buccal. If you have a cusp which is having more angle, whereas on the right side, if you see the cusp is flat. Okay, and when you apply pressure on this, it is more towards the implant. Okay. so you should apply the forces towards the implant not away from the implant and you can do only this thing when you have a cuspal angulation which is you know less so don't try and give you an angle cusp if there is a compromise yeah there is a compromise patient not able to chew properly yes patient not be able to chew properly not as a natural tooth but patient has to understand that he is not having a natural tooth he is no more having a natural tooth anterior impact area okay Now you see, the more you are away from the tooth, okay, and more angulation you are going to give, okay, the more impact is going to be generated. If you see that, if you are going close to the implant and hitting the implant, the forces are directed towards the implant. So always direct your forces towards the implant, not away the implant. Again, the location of the impact area, okay, you are not supposed to go buccally. I have told you that if your implant is already angulated. And you place your forces more buccally. Okay, your implant is lingual. Okay, this is the lingual. Okay, your implant is here, and your 
you know this is your vestibule and this is your buccal vestibule you have uh, enough of you know you don't have any bone and the opposing tooth is in here okay and you apply a load in this direction what will happen this is going to torque away okay you have a cantilever here okay so you cannot have this buccal cusp going into the you know central fossa of the mandible no you will grind this cusp you will use the parietal cusp which is coming into center okay so if you have this kind of situation if you see the diagram which i had posted before just before starting this presentation of when we are talking about the implant okay i told you that the buccal cusps are not coming in contact okay so now if you say that is a lingual eye occlusion yes this is a lingual eye occlusion okay so you try and uh, make sure that your uh, parietal cusp in a in a mandible teeth okay when you have a you know mandible uh, implant okay the parietal cusp is coming and meeting the central fossa which is at the implant opening where the excess opening is there i uh, mean excess through opening is there mm. so general through what you want you want uh, the implant to be making contact at which point <coughs> green point or red point <coughs> the main goal is to improve the dentist stability or axial loading of the single teeth okay so you want your your uh, you know uh, your teeth to be stable and uh, loading should be equivalent okay you want a centric contact on flat surfaces not on inclines okay so this is you are not supposed to have inclines okay patient will complain to you patient is definitely going to complain to you regarding all those things okay but tell him that there is a compromise okay the tell him there is a compromise and compromise for good for the longevity of the implant he wants the implant to be stable he wants the implant to be lasting long again this is a very important point okay what is the difference between figure on the left and right you see that the center of the lower ridge anatomic is set up and a non anatomic set up okay so posterior would get to avoid a cheek biting you are supposed to have posterior over jet you are supposed to have one or two mm of posterior over jet so that over biting is not happening if the teeth are meeting at the front plane they are just just straight okay so the cheek might come in okay but if you have a you know one or two mm over jet the teeth will not be able, i mean the buccal mucosa will not be able to come inside okay so you are supposed to have it but the see the cuspal height the buccal cuspal height the maxillary buccal height rather okay that has been reduced keeping till the cheek away okay so that is a very very common principle where patient comes to you and say that i am having cheek bite okay and when the cheek bite is there make sure i mean what you can do now you can you really don't have much uh, to do with that now cantilever and implant protective occlusion the goal of ipo relative to cantilever is to reduce the force on the lever of pontic uh, region compared with that of implant abutment in addition low lateral load is applied to the cantilever portion and a gradient force type of load that gradually decreases the occlusal content contact force at the length of the cantilever may be beneficial so cantilevers are not really very good for implant okay the goal of cantilever is to reduce the force on the lever of pontic design okay the goal is that but if you are supposed to give a cantilever i mean we give lot of cantilever in the implant okay you know natural tooth you are not supposed to give cantilever because of the difference in the mobility and uh, you know all those uh, factors which you know but if we are supposed to give a cantilever okay then make sure that the cantilever tooth doesn't come in contact with the tooth there is only centric contact there is no eccentric contact happening in there okay that's the sole goal of cantilever and that too it should be further down from your natural tooth i mean for if you have a you know if your 12 micron paper should was uh, coming out here the 24 micron paper should be able to come out okay patient will be i mean patient will complain to you say that you know okay, i am not able to enjoy food in the cantilever area don't bother about it say it's like that only it, it is supposed to last that like only if two implants are 10 you know this is basic principle okay if the two implants are 10 mm apart and they are splinted with a cantilever of 20 uh, mm when if whatever force is applied to a cantilever a force of twice as great will be applied on the farthest apartment of cantilever okay so if, you, if you, it's a seesaw principle okay so if you are it's a with the class one lever if you seen of rpd okay if you see that if you have uh, the fulcrum this is the entire uh, part of the fulcrum okay and you place the lever here so if you apply a less force here the more force can be lifted okay so if you if you know that you want to move a rock how do you move a rock okay you apply a lengthier lever okay 
and with the lambia liver you can really you know you you can shake that uh, ro rock okay so if you are uh, going beyond you know if you are placing six seven okay or if you place place implant on five if you are placing six and seven a small force on a seven will definitely put a larger force on the your uh, father's implant which you place which is very very dangerous okay so try and not to give seven try and give six only and that too if uh, you know uh, permissible then go for a premolar in that area rather than a molar in that area okay the next point which should be noted that if a 25 pound is applied okay the 50 pound is transmitted to the father's implant but on the same implant it is 75 pound okay if you see that it is on a red on a same uh, nearest uh, you know edentulous area the 75 pound pressure is applied in that area okay so cantilevers are not going to give you a very good uh, you know technically very good implant uh, uh, in stable implant for a long uh, long uh, longer duration okay try and reduce that area okay this is again a very classical uh, you know example of a cantilever when you apply forces on the five okay if you say that is 3 4 5 and 6 okay if you apply forces on five it is a positive positive but if you apply on six what will happen the five intrudes and four and three region are going to get the forces which are further away okay so try and reduce the six to a premolar only don't try to try to disseclude rather a 24 micron uh, disclusion is really good for a system of four to six implant following a maximum cantilever are suggested as maxillary anterior this is the law this is the rule follow it okay maxillary anterior 10 mm maxillary posterior 15 mm mandibular posterior is 20 mm and that, now that will depend upon you know the type of uh, your arch okay you have a tapering arch or a square arch in a tapering arch you can have a good amount of length of covering the implant so you can give more cantilever now in ipo that is your implant protected occlusion the width of the occlusal table is related directly to the width of the implant body okay so if you have a central fossa right in the center you see this is five uh, uh, first implant is five okay then there is four and then there is 3.5 okay now in a natural tooth now come to the left side figure natural tooth there is central fossa then there is a d is the central fossa buccal cusp okay and x is the occlusal contact natural tooth will take up okay but division a root form of 4 mm implant you see if the forces are applied on the x it is good okay the further it is going to get away from there okay now what will happen the further it goes away the forces are being taken off the implant when the forces are uh, being taken off the implant and it's going more laterally you are going to apply again the lateral forces which are not good so if you see there's a natural tooth the, the dotted lines are the natural teeth let's see focus on the a and b figure and you have a natural tooth and a you know implant crown okay and you have a uh, on the b side you have a root okay and you have a crown okay so if you see the difference between a natural tooth crown and implant crown and there's a primary contact okay you're supposed to reduce the contact area of the with the natural tooth or implant or if, even if the implant and implant crowns are being in contact the the area of contact should be as minimal as possible so now what are the occlusal scheme we are going to give okay so there are four occlusal scheme which we know the canine garden group function lingualized monoplane so canine garden and group function are with the single teeth and uh, you know fpd whereas lingualized and monoplanes are with the dentures this go now these are the general principles we we know that we used to uh, you know uh, draw the the sign of uh, now lines on this and uh, i'm sure that you understand that the on the crestal line what you have drawn is the uh, guiding plane you are supposed to follow the same principle while you are giving uh, you know by the either you giving a denture or you giving a, you know full bridging processes follow this guiding plane your central grooves are supposed to follow on this guiding plane okay if you are off your guiding plane okay don't follow the bacteriality all of the mandibulality because the mandible bone is much lesser so you are supposed to improve the denture stability or a single tooth loading okay the centric occlusion or a contact over the ridge we want the center of the occlusion okay the centric occlusion should be there the contact should be over the ridge not away from the ridge okay 
if you're trying to go away from the ridge and make a, uh, you know, a contact in there, okay, what will happen? The leverage principle is going to come. So if the ridge is here, okay, the ridge is here, don't try to make a occlusal contact in this area. Try to be here only. Don't try to come here. No buckle and no lingual. Simultaneous posterior contact and center on the, both the sides. Okay. So that is the balanced occlusion. Now, for old and cure of full arch processes opposing your CD. Okay. Now, uh, you know, these are the contacts. You are supposed to have a old jet and overbite. Okay. No anterior contact in center. Okay. It minimizes the anterior resorption. Okay, if this is only for the, you know, denture uh, uh, teeth, okay. Grazing anterior contact in occlusion, that is only the inciting portion of it, okay. Over dentures or a full arch processes, all occlusal schemes devised to maximize the denture stability. So you are going to give denture, it is be like a common natural tooth, I mean, common, uh, you know, your uh, complete denture, you go for a balanced occlusion, okay. You can go for a, a regular occlusion, which is a much better scheme, okay. So you have a maxillary cusp tooth, mandibular cuspless or shallow cusp tooth, maxillary lingual cusp balances like a motor in a pod, uh, in a pestle. So what will happen? A lingual cusp is going to come. I mean, uh, the if you have two cusps, okay. So if this is a buccal cusp and this is a lingual cusp, so lingual cusp will come in contact, not the buccal cusp. Okay, it will going. We stay away. We had discussed all those things before also, and this is a beautiful diagram to predict that. Okay, even. Uh, you can see that how much amount of clearance has been given. Okay. So lingual cusp contact opposing central fossa. Mandibular cusp inclines are shallow. That is 0 to 10 degree. And there will be very less lateral displacement. Your, I mean, this is not for your uh, implant denture. For normal denture also, if you think that the mandibular denture is slightly compromised or mandible ridge is slightly compromised, go for this. This is a much better occlusal scheme. Go for a lingual occlusal scheme. Now, again, a diagram how the you know, occlusal uh, scheme, how the stability is improved. So, simultaneous bilateral anterior and posterior in all exclusion, okay, and tilting forces theoretically are neutralized. Why? Because you, you have a central fossa contact, okay, there is no buccal or lingual uh, contact. The same thing on a balancing side, on a working side, you have mandibular movement. On a balancing side, the lingual cusp is going to go on the buccal cusp, okay. Now you can see there's a buckle, uh, working side and balancing side, and uh, there's a difference of one to two mm between a buckle cusp and a buckle cusp. On a working side, when it is moved on, on you know, working side is where the, you move the mandible, that is the left side. If you're moving the mandible towards left side, the left side becomes the working side, and the right side becomes the balancing side. Okay. So again, the same thing, uh, how you're going to give uh, lingualized occlusion. Okay. Rules of balancing contact. Balancing contact should be lines, not points. Balancing contact should never be heavier than the working contact. Okay, now I, I, I hope you understand what is the balancing contact. When you go move your mandible to the left side, the right side tooth should be uh, meeting. Okay, so those should be the line, they should not be point and balancing contact should never be heavier than the working contact. Okay, because if you are having a higher, con I mean higher forces, then they're going to give you leverages. Lingual cusp, you need to have a, you know, uh, uh, always use steep cusp, maxillary truth, it is 33 degree. I told you, you know, here the patient will not complain you that I'm unable to shear the food because the cuspal angle you have increased by 33 degrees. Okay. The corneal guidance is steeper, use more cusp angle that is mandible is uh, 10 degree. Again, the lingualized occlusion. Balance cannot be set without an articulator. You cannot use it. You cannot set a balanced occlusion, you know, without a using articulator. You are supposed to use the articulator of it. And that is a big problem. I mean, you, uh, you know, communicating with your, uh, with the same articulator, with the technician, that is a big issue. Clinical remounts on an uh, articulator of your adjustment, but you, you can definitely do it in the mouth. If, if you're smart enough, you can definitely achieve it in the mouth or you can do the remounting and you can slightly be better offered. Okay. I, I don't have any theoretical support, but yeah, you can manage it. Crowns or FPD, either canine guidance or a crew function, okay, well, no preference. I had told initially that, you know, if you have a choice between two things, which is going to be preferred, there is no, I mean, that was the evidence-based study and I told you, you cannot say that one function is over the other. Uh, in the same of your scheme, the canine guidance can be good for one person, but a group function can be go for one, one other person, okay. And preferably what patient has used that. 
Now, common practice, this is the takeaway messages, okay? That is common practice of management of implant occlusion. So single tooth restoration, light you know, occlusion with a sliding eight micron shim stock on firm clinch. It should be able to come out, okay? Reduced occlusion uh, table the dimension, reduced occlusion table, okay? Maximum interfacing contact along the long axis only. There should not be any, you know, working and balancing contact, okay? FPD or a fixed uh, complete dentures, okay? Canine protected or a mutually protected occlusion, natural teeth as opposing dentition, anterior teeth disclude the posterior teeth, you know, mutually protected, same like that. When your anterior teeth are going to come in contact, the posterior should be off the occlusion. And when the posterior teeth are coming in contact, the anterior should be coming off the contact, okay? Lingualized occlusion, complete denture as the opposing dentition, maxillary uh, lingual cusp in shallow mandibular central fossa, no mandibular cusp contact should be there. Buckle cusp, okay? Definitely, we know this, you know, buckle cusp, lingual occlusion, buckle cusp cannot come in contact. Now, this is a uh, occlusional guidance for uh, major categories. I am, I'm not sure whether you're able to see it properly, but I'm, I'm trying to, you know, if you can take a snapshot and you can enlarge it later, this is a very good uh, uh, article, okay? And it says about every occlusion scheme, what are you going to have it, okay? How it is going to be there. So, if you have a partial denture, single uh, denture, say, process type, a single to the implant, the light intensity and maximum intensity, the clearance is 30 micron. Where we are discussing about 8 micron, we can go for 30 micron. Maximum intensity, contact should be there. Exclusive movement, there should be no contact. Partially dentulous with distal tooth abutment, pick processes, okay, clearance again 13 micron, contact, and for each exclusive movement, there should be no contact. Now, Unilateral PN. If a canine is present and you are giving a fix processes, make a clearance of 3 mm posterior, okay, but exclusive movement, canine will come in contact. If canine is absent, okay, and you are going to give a fix processes, clearance again 30 micron, maximum intensity contact will be there, okay, and this is going to be a groove function. All the posterior teeth on the working side are going to come in contact. Bilateral PN, fix processes, okay. Contact will be there on both the sides. Oh, no, there is no clearance, okay? Because you, you don't have teeth on both the sides. You, it is not possible for you not to have, okay? So you will have, a, uh, you know, you cannot have, a, it will be contact. Maximum intensity, again, contact on a group function. Mean left side, when you move, the right side will not move, okay? It's a group function. Now, anterior partially dentulous, okay? Pick processes, anterior partially edentulous. You will have a clearance, okay? On both light density and your, maximum intensity, okay? And it will contact when? Only on the protrusion, when the patient protrudes, okay? Now, partially dentulous with distal implant abutment, the implant to supported processes, the clearance will be 3, 30 to 5, 50 micron, maximum intensity contact will be there. On an exclusive movement, okay? There'll be no contact, okay? Now, see the line again, partially dentulous with distal abutment, okay? So if you have a distal abutment, There'll be no contact on the exclusive movement if you have long, long uh, span kind of thing. Completely edentulous for pick processes, contact, contact, and then mutually protected for over denture, the contact, contact, and the balanced occlusion. So that is the occlusion scheme which you are follow, supposed to follow according to the cusp inclines and, you know, cuspal weight and all those things. Now, my condition, uh, you know, mandibular reconstruction and occlusion condition is fully edentulous. And mandibular reconstruction is mucosally supported, uh, mucosally supported uh, mucosa implant processes, balanced occlusion. If you have a Kennedy one uh, class one restored with RPD, and there is a mucosa implant supported implant processes again, balanced occlusion. Now we are following almost the same principle as we would have done in the uh, your uh, RPD. Okay, Kennedy's class two where single part is missing, mucosa implant supported implant processes again, balanced occlusion. Group function on the same side. On the other side, you will have a group function where you are having natural teeth. Okay. Kennedy's classing, bilaterally edentulous. Okay. Then you are going to go for implant supported pick processes, group function or mutually protected. Then Kennedy's class three and class four, implant supported, again, group function, mutually protected. So balanced oxygen is only there while you have bilaterally missing teeth. Okay. Full dentate, maxillary condition is full dentate. Mag four teeth are there. And mandible reconstruction, implant supported, go for a group function or mutually protected occlusion. 
IF rule, IF rule is that inner inclines of the functional cusp, they are the balancing contact. Okay, this is the rule to be followed. Okay, if you have, I'm sorry, what uh, one more, if quantity lines of functional cusp, they are the balancing contact. So make sure that your working contacts are in this area only. Okay, you saw, uh, see this dotted line that is inner inclines and outer inclines. You are supposed to have contacts only on the inner inclines, never on the outer inclines. So inner inclines of the functional cusp. Okay, that is a uh, uh, IF rule. So how do you test it? Okay, you put oxygen, I mean, you put your uh, article paper there and you check for these kind of contacts. Okay, you're supposed to go into the red only. Okay, no green, no black. Okay, this is how you check your oxygen. And this is, I'm not taking this, I was just taken from the book only. Okay, and they are lovely uh, results after a good number of years or so. A proper occlusal scheme is a primary requisite for long-term survival, especially when the parafunction or marginal foundation present. So we are into the conclusion mode now. And if you have a poor occlusal scheme, okay, or increased mechanical stress or a crystal bone, complication of the processes and bone support is bound to happen. Okay, so proper occlusal scheme is needed. This one complicated case, I mean, there are many cases, but uh, already we are up with the time, so I am not going to show you all the cases. But this one case with a, you know, a screw fractured, okay, and uh, this one of my cases only, okay, patient had overloading, he is eating from the same side, okay, we removed it, and this is the removed screw, okay, you are lucky if the screw is fractured, and screw is loose, you can remove it, but if the screw is fractured and screw is not mobile, it is really very dangerous, plus, sometimes what happens, the hex breaks, okay, and you will not realize it. Uh, I'm sorry that I will not be able to show you that picture, but those things are happening, they're really, very dangerous, okay? So, occlusion has been important variable in the success of failures of most prosthodontic uh, reconstruction with uh, natural teeth. A certain degree of flexibility permits compensation for any occlusional irregularities. Implant dentistry is not as forgiving. The status of occlusion must be properly diagnosed, corrected, or compensated for, and they are properly integrated into the design of the definitive restoration. So, Occlusion, you cannot just sideline occlusion and you can make a prosthesis, okay? You, it's not going to give you, you know, it's not going to forgive you. So, this is one good video place, okay? So, this is old habits and die hard. So, this is how, you know, typewriter, you used to do like that. Now, if you have a computer, so, they're there. You die hard, but definitely, I'm, I'm sure that uh, with the new things and new innovations and, uh, you know, new knowledge, and uh, the kind of thing which I have given you, definitely, uh, it's going to give you good help. Okay. Thank you. So I'm ready for the questions, if you have any. Uh, Dr. Shuban, you start with the questions. Yeah, uh, so you have covered most of the questions which we have got, but some of them we have picked out. The first one is about the implant fracture. management implant practice implant practice management well make sure that your implant practice in the initial uh, years is not to the maximum it is to the minimal because implant doesn't give you a lot of money okay implant comes with its own expenses okay so if you are a young dentist and a new dentist go stick to a very simple cases not to complex cases okay grow it very gradually and uh, it's not easy to build up an implant practice and be a successful because you know you have going to have a failure. So, okay, so implant is a long term thing; it's not a short term thing. Stick to your bread butter that is Prospero. I mean, ground preparation and good CD and good first learn all those things. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, and most of the questions which were present in the comment section were very cleared uh, during the session itself. Uh, okay. Also, I have some uh, other questions as well. 
So, uh, sir, can you please let us know what are the causes of implant uh, failure and in such conditions, what are the problems faced by the patient? It's a very broad question, cannot be, you know, answered in two or three lines, but, you know, uh, what patient complains for mostly complains with the screw loosening. And uh, uh, really the implants are going to fail with that. The prostatic uh, porcelain fracture is really very, very common. Okay. But, uh, yeah, you can definitely manage it with the, if you have a good amount of technician to work for it, don't go for a, a you know, compromise uh, technician, go for a standard technician and go for the operative scheme, which are really, uh, you know, understandable by you and understand by a technician. Patients are going to call it, a, you know, many things. Okay, patient doesn't know the occlusion. You know the occlusion. Patient just know that I'm not eating or I'm not eating. Or I'm not eating well. So those kind of things cannot be given to the patient. You know, you will have to uh, uh, tell to the actually to the patient that what decision you have taken is for the betterment for him only. Uh, she also. And uh, we would like to have a last question. So uh, yeah. can you please comment uh, on what is the future of implant? Well, future of, future of the implant is really very great, but the only thing, the most annoying and most worrisome part is ki, the future of root canal should be more rather than future of implant. Okay. So, uh, our main goal is to, you know, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, save the tooth. Okay. Don't try and, uh, you know, uh, remove the tooth uh, and place the implant. If you can save the tooth, please save the tooth. And the kind of uh, implant journey, you know, what we are trying to face or what we are trying, what we are achieving right now, you know, don't trust any technique or don't trust any, anything which is, you know, uh, just introduced. Okay. If you don't have a good amount of follow-up, don't do it. Okay. A socket preservation technique, for example, you know, it was bliss, you know, it was done and, uh, you know, practiced as, uh, widely everywhere. They, they got out the instruments also. They got many things also, but long-term, you know, there were a lot many failures happening because of this. So don't jump into a conclusion. Take your own time to understand. And, uh, you know, uh, don't try to be a hero in dentistry. Hero in dentism doesn't support. Uh, yes, sir. That was a wonderful answer. Only last question. Uh, can you please comment on uh, implant periempatitis? Implant? Periempatitis? Periempatitis, you know... Uh, that is not related to basically, you know, very less related to, you know, implant occlusion. But if you have a peri implantitis, okay, if you, you, you are supposed to have a follow-up of the patient, okay. Uh, poor oral hygiene is the main concentration. Poor oral hygiene is the main thing concern of uh, peri implantitis, okay. A castle bone loss leading to peri implantitis is slightly layer. It is more of a screw losing rather than being peri implanted. But if you have a peri implantitis, react fast, react very, very fast, clean the area. If you think that the implant, uh, the uh, abutment has to be removed, uh, the, uh, the tooth has to be removed, remove it, okay, let the area heal, put the same tooth back. Uh, so, thank you so much for answering all these questions and uh, thank you so much, sir, for this amazing and informative webinar. We are very glad to have you with us and uh, for taking out time and to conduct the webinar. I would now request uh, Dr. Anmol, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, from India and all parts of the globe and wishing you all a very happy Dashera. And I would uh, thank uh, Sir for giving us his valuable time this evening and sharing his knowledge with us. And I'm sure this uh, tips and techniques would help the practitioners to improve their practice. Thank you so much, Sir, for uh, delivering such an informative lecture. And I would also like to thank the host and the co-host for hosting this session today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Take care.